So the most complicated and interesting place in the world for software right now is inside automobiles. And it's going to stay that way for a little while longer as the great revolution in automotive technology sets in, whether that's actual autonomous driving or it's just a whole lot of computers in cars. There's no question that the automobile is the frontier of challenge for all the wonderful things we've learned to do with software and screens and such. Um, I thought this was worth an entire conference last spring uh, because the thing which most interests and consumes me in this discussion about automotive software is automotive software governance. That is, how the hell do we know what software is in a car in the many computers that constitute the network inside the vehicle? And if we don't know what software is in a car, then we don't know what's going to happen out there. Carnage on the nation's highways, as Sandra Day O'Connor once said, and so on. Um, and so I really wanted to concentrate attention on the problems of governing software in cars. That's a subset of the problem of governing software in the age of the cloud. One of the things my friend Dirk Hondel has been talking about in the last year is the ways in which containerization has been very harmful to software governance because everybody just whips it up inside their container factory and ships it out the door in 12 milliseconds and nobody really knows what's in it or whether it's compliant with rules or even more importantly whether it will work. We got very accustomed to non-atomic updating in software distributions a generation ago. And we, we rolled our Debian tree or our RHEL tree together, and then we threw in some other stuff that wasn't from the tree, and we did all kinds of backdating and what have you. And we didn't really know what bits we were running, and we still don't, notwithstanding all the skill of the distribution makers. It can be very hard to tell what is the fixed state of even one computer, let alone a network of computers moving down a highway at 75 miles an hour or so um, under something like do-it-yourself autopilot control. Um, this is obviously uh, just a proving ground for the improvement of software governance. It is just one of the many ways in which the automobile and the revolution of software in the automobile is going to have to pull the quality of technology along behind it. Which is hard because the world's automobile manufacturers are not software companies and they've never been software companies before and leadership in software technology is never a goal that they have set themselves or thought that anybody would ever set for them. But regulators and consumers and all sorts of commercial suppliers or would-be suppliers to the automotive companies want the manufacturers, the OEMs, to become software experts. They want them to figure out how all this stuff can be made to work together and how it can be governed in some rational way that state regulators and inspectors and other people making smart roads and smart vehicles can deal with. This is, this is a good challenge for the world of FOS. We specialize in heterogeneity and adaptability. We specialize in mixed supply chains of corporations and students. We are, we are good at all kinds of things that should make it possible for us to be major improvers of the technology in automobiles. And we are major sufferers from the fact that we don't look like the automotive industry as it has always known itself. We don't fit neatly into the tiers of supplierhood and we don't fit neatly into the world of parts moving towards the vehicle in a hierarchically oriented kind of way. And we really do like the right to tinker and repair. And we really do insist on the right to tinker and repair in all sorts of other social contexts. And we think that the right to tinker and repair is crucial to our ability to make software improve. And none of that is exactly what vehicle manufacturers think. So I thought it was worth a conference next, last spring. I think it's going to be worth a conference next spring. It was certainly worth the work of writing a paper with Mark Shuttleworth, which is work, I will admit, but work well done. Um, 
I, I think this is the place where we ought to have the most challenging time trying to figure out what free software engineering now most needs. The cloud, oh, that's, you know, just you throw billions of dollars worth of hardware together with a lot of free software and you provide a lot of services. It's a no-brainer compared to how you make an automobile explain itself with respect to what is in it and whether it can work together and whether there is some little gremlin of a botched rollback which you should be thinking about in deciding whether your car is safe to drive. So we have, uh, I think, the best of the best to talk about this this afternoon. We're having winnowed it out and had a conference or two already. I, I think that this is the, the very best team that we could have to try and figure out with us what it is that the big issues are. Uh, I'm going to introduce speakers in the order of their participation, and I'm going to start uh, with Daniel Petnayak, who, who offers us the the opportunity to listen to what an automotive company lawyer thinks about all these subjects, it's highly valuable. We had a moment of great poignancy to me in the April conference after Daniel had finished speaking and Jeremiah Foster, who is a man who, after all, has taught software with a lot of automobile companies, Jeremiah stood up and he said, you know, this is the first time in a however many years it was that I've ever had a face-to-face -face conversation with an automotive company lawyer. Well, and that and that just struck me, and that just struck me as a terribly important moment. Daniel Patnaik uh, has worked in the legal department of Audi AG for 18 years. That is, he's a real automotive company lawyer, not a ringer, not, a, not an imposter, not a... And he is now one of the lead in-house counsel within Audi, at present in charge of providing legal advice to technical purchasing, production, and quality assurance departments. His open source experience goes back 14 years. That is, he's an old timer for us. Um, and um, he has uh, dealt with uh, open source matters, including compliance at Audi for some years now. So not just an automotive company lawyer, accessible, really present and willing to talk about things, but as deep expertise as exists about open source in the automotive manufacturer world. I don't need to say very much except would you tell us how it looks these days? Of course. Um, maybe we start the presentation? Yeah, please. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as we did already in uh, spring this year, I th I'm happy to continue our discussions on the topic. So what I want to talk about is uh, copyleft in the supply chain. Um, I want to give you an update where we stand. Um, and I want to um, open an issue, which I also touched in spring a little bit, is the TiVo issue. Um, how can we deal with that um, in the automotive industry? What are ideas uh, to think about? I would like to start with the challenges. Challenges, as you can see here, on one chart, not as sophisticated as Avon did it just before, but maybe summarizing it a little bit in a dense form. So we start from the technical need for a component. So the developers come to me, come to us, and they want to bring a fantastic solution um, to the car for the customer. So they have a technical need, they develop something, they work together, or they um, ask a supplier to handle that and provide that back to the OEM. That's the starting point. Of course, there is um, an issue of uh, protection of IP. Of course, we want to be aware, be ahead of uh, our IP. We want to know um, and we want to protect that know-how. We have on the other side, uh, going to the, to the left side, of course, a very important issue. This is the security, the security of a system, of a car, of um, not only in terms of uh, safety, but more in, in terms of security. Is everybody, anybody um, able to, to do things um, or do we have a secured um, system, system, and then we are in the conflict of 
having uh, potential different interpretation of licenses. Um, as we have heard in the morning, I think in a very uh, perfect way, we have heard of uh, ambiguity. ambiguity. Um, so that means uh, a license can have many meanings. And this is also a topic I see in my daily practice and where we struggle when we talk to our, to our engineers as of how can we, do we have to understand and how do we have to implement uh, things. Now looking um, way far ahead, we are today not there. Um, we are starting with different levels of uh, autonomy in the car. Um, but once we have those cars on, on the road, and we will touch that a little bit later as well, um, and we have um, uh, codes in the cars which give uh, the customer the freedom to make modifications, then um, I'm just imagining an autonomous car driving around with a software which was modified by, by the user. So that's something where you can see that this is really a challenge where we need to work on, where we need to get a common understanding how this can be done, mitigating security, but also here in that case, safety on this other side, the freedom um, by, by the user. So how are we handling the challenges? To give you an update here um, from top to down, first of all, we have started to elaborate terms and conditions um, over the last year. Clearly speaking here, we have, a, we have um, opted for a very liberal approach. We don't have a general prohibition of licenses. So we don't, I don't like blacklists. Of course, we can, we can have, I, I, I prefer to say we work with a kind of a, a best practice list to see where, where we have good experience. But I don't like blacklists because um, I don't want to limit um, our um, technical guys um, towards solutions. If they come up with a solution which is maybe under a, a, a difficult license, then I, at least I would like to understand what it's all about. But if I would, from the very beginning, start and say, no, because this or this solution is under a certain license, then I would limit the business. And um, I would like to support the business, and that's what, our, um, what my team is doing. So what, I'm sta what I've stated here, it's all about transparency. What I would like to have is um, transparency, and this is something I, I, uh, we are trying to achieve through the terms and conditions. So already in the terms and conditions, I note down that I want, would like to have the transparency. How do we do that? And this is the second bullet point. It's the Audi open source diagnostics. Uh, we have developed that, um, uh, I think, already eight years uh, ago with uh, one of our uh, daughter companies, Audi Electronic Ventures. Um, where we have set up uh, a tool which, first of all, um, uh, is uh, obligatory to the persons using its own developers, but it's also our um, suppliers, that they say what software stake they're using, under what license that is, and what they want to do. Is it something they want to alter, they want to distribute, and an end, or they want to bring it um, where? It could be Audi cars, it could be Audi apps, it could be um, just software behind, which is used on our desktops. So that's something we um, developed some years ago, and that helps us to get that kind of um, transparency, because um, we um, uh, oblige all our suppliers to fill in data into our open source diagnostics, and that's, um, we get that and, and with that information then at the end of the day we can and the lawyers can uh, then better understand and better evaluate whether this is of a high risk or we need to change something even structural wise and something which we are still in the process of organizing is um, establishing checkpoints along the software build process I've uh, put a small um, uh, uh, picture here so 
the touch points or the checkpoints we would like to establish are very early. So let's say, let's, stay, let's start here. This is the 100% software. So the software is 100% clear and you're probably not uh, able to change it so easily. And this is a very late stage. So where I want to get is, um, I would like to get here in the software ordering process. And already here, I would like to understand from the company, what software are you going to use? And if this is not clear at that moment, of course, then finally somewhere here in the software build process, so this is the software development, somewhere here, um, I would like to have that checkpoints as well. And then finally, on the, on the latest, uh, the last point again, 100% software, this is a confirmation on either what, it was, what, what, has, what, what was planned, was it uh, fulfilled, uh, did we make changes, was there maybe alteration, did we have to add, did we have to add um, any other software. Um, this chart should show you um, the supply chain. Um, the red top arrow shows the contractual side. So we as an OEM, our main contract, and therefore this is in the is in a small box. Our main contact is the tier one. Now the tier one might have a tier two, three, four, and you can see there are multiple ways to to do it. You can go left or right, down and up. So this could be a, this can be an as uh, even just said it is a container and could be having multiple um, uh, sub tiers who would contribute to to a container. So and at the end of the day. We have a tier one, and he's the responsible person on our side because to who, to him we have uh, a contractual side. He might have contract with others, but that's how we follow um, the line. And then in the deliverables, where we say we want to have information about um, what software is in, then it goes the way around. It goes from the tier five to the tier four, and so on to the to the tier one. And he then finally provides the package to us. If we, if we look at the Audi open source diagnostics, which I just touched um, a minute ago, this, should, the, this slide shall show again here there might be different software modules from the tier three to the tier two or three, uh, tier one. And at the end of the day, what I like to see and understand and at, finally at the end of the day is how do all the um, open source modules look like? And that's, that gets aggregated in our tool and then we have that transparency where we need. I admit that uh, currently we're still always very at the end of the software build process, but I, as I said, I want to drag the whole thing to the front. And uh, to David, uh, he's currently not in the room, uh, we are looking at also uh, the open chain um, very closely and uh, hopefully will will be there uh, also shortly. Now, apart from that, um, I, I, I wanted to touch the, the TiVo issue. I, I don't know how deep I have to go into the TiVo issue. Um, this was, a, it's a term for a security measure. Uh, it's meanwhile widely um, used uh, technique in commercial products to prevent software which is not signed from running on a system. And that poses uh, problems um, uh, where, which we can see in a moment. So again, here is the area of conflict. The developers need to secure software against manipulation. Um, as you've seen, the autonomous car was a, was a highly security, um, uh, could, could pose security risk. They want to protect the IP and uh, implement certain technical features. Now, of course, there's a legal need for compliance with uh, the components because of potential claims, whatever. And sometimes um, a, rebel, a liberal or interpretation regarding license provisions is possible. So. What would be the options? Option one would be a very safe option. Do not use LGPL 2.1 or um, GPL 3.0. Uh, 
um, in uh, T-voiced um, systems. This could be a very easy and, and safe options, but as I said in the beginning, I don't want to uh, hinder um, technology coming into into our cars, into our systems. So um, the other option would be to make sure um, the user is able to exchange the respective uh, open source component with modified versions of a, of a library, for example, and still get the whole thing to work in a proper way, operate properly, as I wrote down here, um, to be able to execute modified versions. So I, on, the, on the next slide, you can see how that could be possibly made. It's just an idea how, what, what we are thinking, uh, how to solve that uh, problem. So on the, on the left-hand side, you could see that we have that lib included in partition one. And then, of course, if, uh, if, if, if that software is, um, is secured and after the change by the, by the end user, by the customer, you, you find out that it was changed and then the whole thing doesn't run, that would make um, uh, it non-compliant in case of uh, the FOSS license um, because of the TVO issue, which was implemented in uh, GPL 3.0 or LGPL 2.0. Zero. Uh, so the solution we are thinking about, and that goes a little bit into also, I think, uh, Eben's uh, uh, direction or thoughts is to maybe separate um, component lib is placed in a separate file system um, part partition instead of including it into into that part part over here. Uh, so. It could be deactivated upon request of a user allowing exchange. And so even if uh, the protection for a partition lib is deactivated, the rest of the system, including partition one, could be, uh, could be um, continued to be protected by the observer. So that could be um, a solution. But if we then look at what does it mean for the system, um, if the TiVo issue is interdicted and the, the user must be always able to get to get a, uh, a program to run properly, um, then what does it mean? Um, to what extent does the um, system have to be able to run properly? Do we go to the smallest part of it, which could be a part of the interpretation? Or does the entire system, so the entire car has to run? To make an example, if you have something, the real estate entertainment, there is also um, open source software involved. Does it mean that the real estate entertainment has to work? Um, and if there is a change and maybe not secured anymore, does it mean that, of course, the, the customer could make alteration? So maybe this, the, the, the last part um, could, could be affected, but not the entire car. So these are the challenges, and I just wanted to bring up the, the issues. Uh, I don't have a solution right now. We're thinking about solution, as you've seen. Um, it's uh, not that easy, as you can as you can understand. Um, I wanted to bring up um, those questions, and that should be my part for the moment. I actually think that it might be a good idea, Andrew, if you uh, responded directly to that, since this is, after all, what we have been trying to think about ourselves, uh, and uh, Lilani can wait just a moment. So, um, just jump in. I'm not even going to introduce you. Just <laughs> go ahead. All right. Um, I'm Andrew Sinclair. I work uh, at Canonical. We are a supplier of uh, Linux operating system, Ubuntu. Um, and uh, as a supplier, we supply uh, everybody that might need an operating system. Um, as Evan pointed out, there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of That's momentum good. and traction in uh, data centers and cloud computing. That's uh, that's off and running, and I think now we're in a, at a point where there's um, a, a new market, which is 
um, really broadly speaking, uh, just new devices that didn't used to have computers in them that, that now do. And so that's certainly cars. It's, there's always the example of the, the thermostat, <laughs> you know, a device that didn't used to have any computing capabilities and now does. Um, cars are <clears throat> having more and more computers in them to do every, everything in the car, and all those computers form uh, networks in cars that uh, do all kinds of things, operate the vehicle, but also provide you a map and uh, provide you music streaming and internet connectivity and, and everything. And wherever you have a computer, you have software, you have an operating system. Um, and so uh, as a supplier of a general purpose operating system, I, I should say whenever you have an operating system, it's most likely, if it's in a new computer, it's most, it's most likely free software because it's most likely Linux because there's uh, not likely to be, um, if, if, if you're going to launch a new, uh, a new car that has 40 computers in it, um, there's a, a lot of economic benefits to using uh, a free software operating system on some or most of those computers. Um, you have the benefits of the user innovation that comes out of the free software development model. Uh, you have the benefits of being able to see what's, uh, what's going on on those computers. There's the, the end user freedoms. Um, cost, uh, you're not paying a royalty uh, to somebody uh, for each of those computers uh, every time you ship a car or every year that that car is operating or every month that that car is pinging a, a server somewhere to download uh, music or maps. Uh, and so we've found that uh, there's a, a basically a new class of customers for us uh, that are interested in um, that well they have they have slightly different uh, interests and requirements for what they're doing. And in particular, I, I would say there's, a, uh, there's an interest in security, uh, verification, trusted computing. Um, these are things that are particularly present in, in an automotive context where the computers aren't, uh, not, to, not to downplay that you, know, you can't have problems in a data center, but here you have uh, a device that weighs a couple tons and is barreling down the road and there's people trying to cross the street. Um, this is a, a, really, um, a, a really physical manifestation of computing and that code and the verif verification of that code and the trustworthiness of that device um, I think really matters to, to a lot of people in a, um, a really tangible way that um, maybe was significant, is significant in, in other uh, computing environments, but it's just really obvious in, in, uh, in the automotive context. And so uh, one thing that Canonical's done uh, and been interested in doing to, uh, to supply into this market, the market of, of automotive, but also of uh, IoT generally, new next generation devices generally, um, is to create a, um, a system where uh, well, it's what, what Evan was referring to as software governance. The concept that there are multiple components, uh, multiple systems working in concert with each other, um, and that there's a mechanism for those components to validate and trust each other um, and to report on each other so that you can have a system that um, has, has those benefits, verification, trust, et cetera. Um, and that leads to safety, which, which what I think uh, is particularly relevant in the automotive context. Um, I think there's uh, maybe a, something to ponder is how consistent or inconsistent is that with free software principles, which are about openness and uh, user rights to modify. Um, the, the example of the the autonomous car that's been user modified coming down the road. Um, I, I don't know that that, <laughs> I have to say, I'm not sure that scares me more than just a driver coming down the road. <laughs> it's al there's already a human there that's making up their own mind about how they think, where they think that car should be going. Um, and I guess you, you, you hope that, uh, there, I don't know, maybe, maybe the difference is that there's some instinctual, uh, save humankind <laughs> instinct when you're driving and when you're uh, writing or modifying software that you may not think all the way through uh, the consequences of that modification. 
Um, but I, I think um, I think there is a balance that uh, that we need to uh, investigate and find uh, where uh, where car manufacturers can have the benefits of the economics, um, where users and consumers can have the benefits of uh, the, the other great things about software under free software licensing um, and do that in a way that doesn't increase, doesn't have negative consequences. Um, and so I, I've, uh, uh, the, the kinds of questions that we get from, uh, from suppliers, you know, on your, on your chart, Daniel, of the, uh, the tiers of suppliers, uh, we tend not to be <laughs> the one that's directly providing software to, to the OEM. Um, and so one, uh, one thing that we encounter is a, um, I'm, I'm, it's nice to hear that Audi doesn't have a blacklist against licenses. Um, but I think other, there are manufacturers that do have those blacklists and uh, they, uh, uh, those, those lists are relayed through the, the, su the supply chain um, and we have this kind of problem where we have this, uh, just a lack of conversation with, uh, between uh, someone like Canonical, an upstream supplier of a, of a very low in the stack operating system or operating system components, um, and a, a customer who's sort of behind a, a veil, behind a couple other suppliers um, that uh, we think we have a really good solution for and a really good licensing model for. Um, and, uh, but their suppliers, their, the, the tiers in the middle think that one of their roles is to just kind of relay, well, that doesn't meet the spec. That's, you know, that's GPLv3, that's, that's, doesn't meet the spec. The spec requires no GPLv3. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in finding a way to, uh, have a discussion with the industry about, um, that, you know, I really appreciate that you're, you're looking for ways to actually uh, incorporate that software um, and, and do it in a way that uh, takes all the benefits of, of the licensing model that it's under and also reduces any risks that uh, are perceived by the OEM. So um, it would be great to uh, kind of investigate how we can uh, get more, more OEMs thinking that way and listening to their developers uh, who are interested, I think, in the, um, uh, the economic benefits of free software, um, but also, um, you know, balance their interests with, uh, with the uh, development. It's, it's more of a development model than a licensing model, I, I think, but, uh, the, the free software development model, and get, get all those benefits. So before we go any further, let me just try and apply that directly to what Daniel was talking about. This was the motivation of the work that Mark and I did last winter. Uh, if you're trying to answer Daniel's questions about how do we deal with m user modified software in an autonomous vehicle and how do we deal with the, the kind of uh, containerizing or isolating that he was pointing to in his charts, what would happen if we looked at the way we package software generally as, an, as, a, as the arena of solution for his problem? And here, the, the interest that I took in SNAPS as a form of software distribution had two pieces to it. Suppose we were to begin packaging free software generally in distribution structures which provided for ACID kinds of changes so that everything is only itself, it doesn't have any side effects, it can't be modified once installed without going through the modification system, and it can be rolled back. A structure like SNAPS in which every package has its own read-only code repository and local data located in one specific place no longer risks all the various interaction difficulties that we experience when we upgrade a single package or a few packages in a distribution like Debian or 
Fedora or any of the other distributions packaged as we're usually aware. And Daniel's diagrams show the need for some monitoring entity checking the state of software at all times. What if that monitoring entity were both smart enough and correctly hooked together so that there was fine granularity in permissions about what individual programs can do? Snap packaging was just an example, important to canonical, but from my point of view, important as a general advance in packaging, that allowed us to achieve those two goals without asking the OEM to do anything, because the operating system supplier has already decided to change the way packaging works. Now we have a, 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 a kind of uh, granularity in both knowing what versions of software are installed and being able to roll them back automatically at the package management level. GPL3, when we wrote it to provide for a requirement for users to get installation information to allow them to modify the versions of GPL3 programs running in their computers, GPL3 section 6 provided for the statement that if the network on which the computer is resident would be made unsafe or inoperable by a particular modification, then network services can be denied to that modified version. Richard and I had primarily cellular telephone networks and other similar things in mind in 2006 when we wrote those la with that language, but we left it general for precisely the sort of situation of a specialized network of computers, which is the situation of the contemporary automobile. The idea was if you're going to endanger the safety of the network with a modification, then maybe that modification should not be allowed to talk to the vehicle network. This allows us the kind of granularity at the package management level in which we can say, oh, right, so your, um, get another one with a not dead battery in it. That would be the correct solution. Thank you. Um, so, so now what we're doing is saying, you have a, a vehicle entertainment system uh, and you also have driving control. You have braking and you have steering. And you have, if you modify the, the, the media player in the car under GPL3, the media player might have a slightly different set of privileges on the network now that you've modified it. The manufacturer provided entertainment system might actually interact with braking and steering control for some reason in some way or other. But, but, but let's hope not. And the modified version certainly won't be able to because the SNAPD or equivalent software governance demon inside the car won't let it. If we create that layer at the packaging level, then what we have already is all the facilities that the manufacturer would need to have once the whole operating system is supplied to it. It now has enough control that it can even do things like have GPS decide which software should be running. If you're over here on your own property, do whatever you want. Once you're on a smart road, you have to be running manufacturer software because otherwise the smart road might fail. And, and that can be decided on the basis of physical location or any other set of inputs inside the vehicle which say what software should be running there. I think the important point about the fact that you're not a tier one supplier means that whatever is going to happen has to be very general. It isn't going to come through one set of negotiations between one OEM and one component supplier. It's not going to happen in the form of a bilateral negotiation between Audi and Bosch. It's going to have to be something which works for everybody, which is as good for Toyota as it is good for VW. It's right. and, and that means that we might want to look at the layers of software provision which are the domain of the experts in software provision, regardless of whether they manufacture spark plugs or injectors or anything else. If we did the software provisioning correctly at the operating system level, maybe we could solve this problem for cars 
which is a very hard problem in general of software governance. Maybe at that point, IoT microwave ovens wouldn't seem quite as daunting <laughs> problem as they seem now. That, I think, is sort of the technical progress that I would hope somehow that we can make. But of course, all of this is done by hand-waving instead of by research. So this is where I, I, I want to get Leilani involved. Leilani Gilpin um, is a PhD student at, in electrical engineering and CS at MIT working for uh, my very favorite MIT professor, Jerry Sussman. Uh, and is uh, particularly engaged at the moment uh, in uh, a, per a one explanatory artificial intelligence uh, project, namely uh, The Car Can Explain, uh, which is a, a Toyota research initiative project uh, being conducted at MIT. Leilani's research is about the question, how do you get the car to tell you what it's doing, which is, of course, uh, a very important uh, outgrowth of the question of, well, how did that software get in the car in the first place? So from the point of view of somebody who wants to try and make these systems actually transparent enough that they can say what they do, what do you think is the, the, the way software has to get into the car in order for that to be possible? Great question. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start by saying the project that I've been working on has been open source since day one. So our goal has always been that people can use it and people can contribute to it, um, and that's always been a goal of ours. Um, and I sort of wanted to highlight the fact that there's a huge disconnect between the systems that we're building now and the systems that would actually help society and these sorts of software um, governance by design that we're trying to make. Um, so I wrote a few notes this morning because I was feeling pretty inspired. Um, and uh, so Julia Angwin had said that you can't solve a problem until you correctly diagnose it. And unfortunately, the sort of diagnostic systems that we have in the car now are just not that good. Um, we keep adding more and more complexity to these vehicles to make them more autonomous, to make them smarter, and we're inherently adding more ways that they can fail. And it's extremely rare that these failures um, are a single point of failure or that they're local. And so what we really need is we have to think about the incorporation of how these parts work together. And if we want to know how these parts work together, we need to know what they're actually doing. We need to know what they're doing in software. We need to know what the mechanical systems are doing. We need to know what the data looks like. Um, and unfortunately, we don't really know any of that because all of the majority of the software is proprietary. Uh, the majority of the mechanical systems systems are sort of distributed throughout the world and we don't really know what they're doing um, and the data is private. So um, a lot of the big problems that I see is that we're trying to build these explanatory systems but we don't actually know what these things look like. Um, and so for us, our research relies on having data, our research relies on having access to the mechanical um, parts of the car um, and it relies on knowing exactly what the data looks like. Um, so if you heard me speak last spring, I was saying how everything that we do is simulated, but we really need to work towards real world examples. Um, and we really need to force these mechanisms to explain. And so that has been sort of the focus of my research is that developing these explanations that can actually be used for society and for policymakers and for people working in the government so that they actually know what's going on. But we can't do that without open software. So assuming just for a moment that we could see all the software in cars. Would we then understand what is going on? Is visibility the primary limitation? I would say it's one of them. So again, it's, it's, it, it's so many intertwined systems working together. It's the network, it's the software, it's the mechanical systems, it's you know, what was the latest software update that was pushed or was it pushed back or is there a wire broken? Um, so I think, you know, having transparent systems would be wonderful and would be a huge step forward. Um, but it, it, we really need to think about, you know, sort of open software and these open mechanisms by design. So they're designed so that we can sort of augment them, we can know what they're doing, we can force them to explain. Daniel, how, how far is that consistent with that constant protection of IP motive throughout the supply chain? Um, a challenge again. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I can understand that it is uh, important um, to understand. Probably this will be also something evolving. Uh, the more and more uh, open source software gets into the cars, also in, let's say, drivetrain, um, uh, bumper uh, system that could could evolve. Um, 
At the moment, you are right, this is proprietary. It's probably, probably also proprietary because it's also differentiating, uh, differentiating um, and uh, against competitors. In order to say we have a certain setup which others aren't able to do, therefore our cars is more sporty, more premium than than others. So um, going to that art, uh, area will will uh, will be a real uh, challenge. Um, safeguarding IP um, competition, um, but I can I can understand maybe it has to go into the direction that we have to define areas where there need to be needs to be more openness, maybe also for the regulator. Um, and then I think uh, this can be a match. So that's the good of society part of it, isn't it, Leilani, right? I mean, if we're gonna, if we're gonna have the good of society, then society is eventually gonna have to speak on these subjects. And it's gonna have to say, this is what manufacturers have to do in order to build responsible products. So is there gonna be a sort of list of, if we're going to have explainable technology in cars, this is what the regulators are going to have to provide for? Is one output of this research the kind of direction for policymakers that, uh, uh, that, that Max was talking about in the morning? Are we gonna have research clarity about what it is that the rules have to provide? Exactly, so I think, um so with all of these errors, I think there's just like a big disconnect between what the technical community is doing and what policymakers are sort of what we say is good for society, right? Um, and we just did a sort of large scale review paper where we were looking at sort of the state of the art explanatory methods. Um, and we defined that there are really two things you need to have a truly explainable system that can build trust. And one is that you need the explanations to be interpretable. So you need humans to be able to understand what they're doing and that's not a technical expert. Right, just having a system that explains for a software engineer is really great, but that's not gonna build the trust of a customer. But then you also need that explanation to be complete. So you need it to be true to the model, true to the data, true to the software um, that it's looking at. So a lot of these explanatory methods will sort of use a proxy model that's easy to explain. So they'll fit it to some sort of linear system, but that's not actually what the model is doing. Um, and so I think taking that one step further, so having explanations that are interpretable and complete, but you also want them to cater to what policymakers want. So you want them to tell a coherent story. And so that's the last thing that we're looking at, is that you can't, you can't just sort of provide explanations without background. You really need to make sure that you look at what you had done, what you were doing, and what you're doing moving forward. Okay, Jeremiah, table is set. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have to say that Jeremiah Foster is from Boston because this week it really matters whether you're a Red Sox guy or a Yankees guy. He lives, he lives in Connecticut at the border between right. two cultures. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jeremiah is the community manager for Geneva and an open source technologist at Luxoft. Luxoft is the promise of open source in cars, the only, uh, the, the only operation of its kind in the world as far as I know, and therefore Jeremiah is the expert at making trouble about this. We have been talking about GPL3 right. in cars since there was GPL3. Um, what do you think? Indeed. Where are we now? Well, you know, I mean, your conferences tend to have wonderful rhyming themes, or the theme works through everything. And I think, again, we've come to it today, um, peace in our time, and I think one of the masterful things that we've done um, in, in our community is that we have a stable API in the Linux kernel, and that's enabled things like containers, which are just a stable API, but in user land, let's say, or controlled by C groups and, and namespaces, et cetera. And as Dirk Handel says, you know, people just jam a lot of software goo in there and it's a wonder that it works at all. We have no idea if it's compliant, probably not, whatever, but they, it does work amazingly enough because it's going against this rock hard stable API. I mean, we have a, a fascist in, in charge of our program. Okay, he's a reform fascist, but you know, you'll get Linus very upset if you break backwards compatibility. Rightly so, he's right. So when you talk about software packaging, when you talk about containerization, that is a perfect place for uh, GPLv3 to interact with that stable API. And so I think, there, I think there's consensus, as you say. We can use GPLv3 software. We can allow users to modify it. Um, but we also have to have the safety preconditions. And now that we have this kind of introspection into the vehicle or if we can build around those systems like 
the snap daemon, uh, like containerization, uh, then I think we can achieve that without question. So, I, I mean, I think it's no longer, it shouldn't be controversial anymore, you know? And, right. and it's, as Daniel says, let the engineers innovate. The license be damned. It's orthogonal, you know? The license issue really should be an ortho a separate issue. In Use your, what works. In your view, is the race to autonomous operation getting in the way of some things that we might do in the engineering if we weren't running towards computer driving? I, I see why you say that. I mean, they say it's a trillion dollar market, uh, mobility as a service or autonomous vehicles. I would say there seems to be a parallel track, fortunately, with uh, advanced driver assistance or ADAS technologies. So we're seeing a lot of that autonomy come in um, already to a lot of vehicles. You know, Toyota has great lane change and Mercedes has sort of in traffic following and those kinds of things. Um, you know, Volvo has city safety. So hopefully no is the short answer to the question. But um, yeah, I think there are certainly companies that are going to do the moonshot and try and surpass all the OEMs. I don't know if they'll be successful. And uh, I worry about... It might happen. And I worry about the, the kind of environment proposed by the shared mobility principles in which software governance is just so hard to do yeah. that the only people who should be allowed to own self-driving cars are Lyft and Uber. Right? <laughs> yeah. That the idea that a self-driving car is such a software maintenance problem that don't try this at home, don't plan to own one, we will, right? That model of transportation as a service is being driven in part by the idea that we're not we're not good enough at software to allow the car to continue to remain the domain of individual liberation that it has been since Henry Ford. Right. And that, again, seems to me to be an outgrowth of the idea that autonomous operation is the, the, the objective of all engineering. If we could first make cars smarter without making them autonomous, maybe we would pay attention to some of those software issues in a different way. Right? That, that, that's an instinct on my part, not as it is in your world, a, a technical reality of daily life. Um, but, but it does feel in a way as though the completeness of autonomous operation is the enemy of some lower level, low hanging fruit of technical improvement in software and cars. No question. And I think that that's driven by a venture capital uh, regime for, for a lot of software companies. You know, it's like, okay, if we can get a hands on our billion dollars, we'll be able to put one of the big three out of business. But it just ain't so because, first of all, it's going to take a lot of infrastructure. And second of all, car companies are saying, okay, you think only you people can do mobility as a platform? Hold my beer. And they're going out and they're making software. And you know what? They know a heck of a lot about GPL. They know a heck of a lot about licensing. They know a heck of a lot about supply chain that maybe Uber might never know. Um, you well, know, the, all that just-in-time stuff, you know, for heaven's sakes, I mean, building cars is wicked hard. So, one, of the, one of the things I experience in my relation with the European Commission is that the Commission wakes up in a cold sweat on alternate nights, Monday, <laughs> Wednesday. On Monday night, they wake up in a cold sweat in at the prospect of the Google car. And on Wednesday, they wake up in a cold sweat on the prospect of the Apple car. And they worry about the destruction of this great European manufacturing industry that the automobile has been by a smartphone on wheels that will be not a European production at all. Uh, if the regulators are worrying about that, that functions in my view as a kind of apocalypse on one side that the, autonomous, the fully autonomous operation feels like as the apocalypse on the other side. We should be taking this a little slower. Right. We should be perfecting some elements of the automobile's relationship to software before that moonshot you keep talking about, which is going to be some highly integrated, vertically contained, highly containerized, you can't change it, it's yes. an appliance platform, which gives all sorts of telemetry to whoever it is who owns the data, which may be is from my point of view as a theorist about freedom and technology the biggest problem of all, right? The modification I want to be able to make to that software is the modification which gives me the telemetry data or which puts it in my safe and solid box somewhere 
and allows my identity as I have invested it in my car, because people have been investing identity in automobiles since automobiles, um, that to, to give me the control over that identity, which the image of the car as personal freedom always presented. I think we are at risk of destroying that very valuable idea of the automobile as personal freedom on the basis of software engineering. We could have done better. Comments, uh, questions, uh, involvement from the many knowledgeable people who are here, Sean? So um, I know that software has bugs, and I know that, <laughs> surprise, um, I know that software that can be it's... tampered with, right? Um, and you all are thinking very hard about how to deal with updates and patches and anti-tamper mechanisms and so on. Um, the issue that I'm worried about is uh, side channel attacks. Um, so specifically, there's a car manufacturer who's not, or a company that's not someone on the stage, um, that's using ultrasonic tones coming from um, speakers and then picked up by a microphone in the vehicle to do things uh, in the vehicle. And it seems to me that that kind of attack is something that we'll never get around if we have digital components controlling the logic that actually drives the vehicle. So if you could just comment on that, and I'm especially obviously thinking about autonomous vehicles. Thank you. Well, you know, I won't speak for Daniel, but security is taken very, very seriously by OEMs, super seriously, and they, they have complete and comprehensive programs. Um, this ultrasonic stuff, I, I think I saw that article too. Um, hopefully, when you architect these systems, the braking system is not connected to the media player, as we mentioned before. And, that the braking system's usually a single wire. It's just a CAN bus. Yes, they do obfuscation for security. It's not particularly secure at all. But, you know, those things shouldn't be susceptible to those attacks. Um, part of its simplicity is, will make it vulnerable to attacks. But look at it from a car maker's perspective. This works. They know how to use it. It's been around for decades. It's not going away. So, um, yeah, I, obscure side channel attacks, I don't know how you're going to defend against that at this point. Well, I mean, just one, one thing to add, you can, uh, one shift that's happening in automotive is the over-the-air updates and, and the, uh, the availability of those. So, um, just like there's vulnerabilities exposed daily in other computing systems, uh, when those vulnerabilities are exposed, if you have a system that can be updated quickly, you can at least patch the vulnerability um, with something like an over-the-air update. That's a big change in, um, in the industry where uh, there's a lot of manufacturers where if, if you need an update to your car, you need to drive it into the service center for that manufacturer and schedule an appointment, and, and that's way too late, right? If the vulnerability exists today, I can't wait two weeks to have it patched. So um, I think that's a natural, um, that is a natural progression to just having more software in cars and more networking in cars and, um, and these systems that support, um, uh, that support the authentication between components uh, can really help mitigate that problem. It may not, may not eliminate it, but it, it can help uh, reduce the risk. Mr. Adler. So, if possible, I'd like to hear some expansion on this idea that using SnapD or a similar um, enclosed containerization technology is an acceptable and safe pattern to use to put GPL3 license code into regulated controlled lockdown hardware computer components, and IoT components. Um, many of us have been looking for ways of being able to handle GPL3 in these kind of environments without it costing a huge amount of liability or huge amount of IP risk or a huge amount of development costs. Does anyone have anything to say about that? Well, in that great big uh, pile of paper that people got for <coughs> continuing legal education credit is our paper, Shuttleworths and Mine, on the subject, which you can also find at softwarefreedom.org and maybe other places if Mark also is choosing to publish it. The, the concept is already fully uh, communicated, right? There's a little more detail there, and I'm continuing to work on a set of ideas about uh, software governance and packaging for which SnapD is, for which SNAPs are merely 
an illustration. But the basic principle is that the license allows the necessary discriminations on a network to protect the network's safety and operation. So that there may at the end be a judgment call that might one day reach court about whether the manufacturers signed assertions about what a modified program is allowed to do were beyond what the license permitted them to limit. But generally speaking, where we are talking about safety and security, I'm content that the license is drafted in such a way that modification of network access at the fine-grained functional level is an appropriate mode of compliance with the license. So we may then have eliminated a legal risk issue because you treat the modified version of the software slightly differently than you treat the unmodified version of the software. It's also terribly important from my point of view that packaging be of a kind which eliminates side effects in the tree from the installation of patches or modified versions. It's all very well to talk about an uh, over-the-air modification of the car in order to provide a security fix, but it's really necessary, A, to be absolutely certain what that patch is and to be able to roll it back if it turns out to brick the car. There have been many a patch Tuesday on which many valid patches turned out to be a little hard to operate in a computer which had turned itself off and wouldn't turn itself back on again. So acidity in the system, the ability to roll back, the ability to avoid side effects in software installation is a big part of why I think this works from a liability perspective with respect to safety or security. Yeah, I do think, I hope that cars are here a model for the solution of a lot of general problems. I want to do whatever can be done to address the preservation of the right to tinker and the right to modify and the right to experiment in the real world in the most complicated place possible, which is why it seemed to me the car was the place to start. Is that responsive, or did you have more you wanted? Okay, thank you. But I'll, let, I'll, let I'll me just let me paper. just add uh, one thing, um, and this comes back to the discussion in the morning. We could wait until uh, uh, a court uh, rules on that, but I think it's important to mm -hmm. to have this as a community understanding with with Eben and uh, Mike, uh, Mark Shuttleworth, uh, and and myself a little bit here in slides. Uh, communicate as solutions to establish that as a, a community understanding. That would be, I think, a good a good I, result. No, I think that's absolutely right. I don't think this is going to turn out to be matter of litigation. I don't think anybody's ever really going to go to court to say, you infringe the copyright of my GPL3 program because when it's running in a car, you decided to limit access to the moving the mirrors around right. When, when you are changing the music being played. Yeah, you may think that's a clever change, and you can run it in your driveway, but you can't run it on the road. And as we get more smart road technology and the question of the relation between the car and non-car parts of the network becomes more important, we're surely not going to wind up trying to adjudicate whether it was a, 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 an infringing modification of VLC to say, you know, you can't shut down the smart road, you can't turn the LiDAR off, there's a whole lot of stuff you're simply not allowed to do. You're just a media player for heaven. So I think we're going to get pretty easily to common sense about that in law if, as you say, we have otherwise good industry-wide understandings, principles of how to do this. And those are going to be desirable for manufacturers because they're going to hold regulators at bay. The problem, of the, the problem of the regulator's anxiety is a problem that the manufacturer wants to resolve. All manufacturers want to resolve by saying, no, no, you don't have to worry about it. We have really excellent self-governing principles. We really understand the building materials that we use. You don't need to ask us about the steel in the car. We look after the steel in the car just fine ourselves. That, I think, is going to be the force which is going to bring people to the table to get to these good common answers because Leilani is right that, you know, the regulators are going to demand this. And if regulators around the world are demanding it, even to the extent that they want to help their local manufacturers live strong and do well, they're still going to need the kind of technical understandings that we're talking about. All right, one more question if there is one. Yes. Manual. 
Law students break things. We, we, we charge them, but they break them anyway. Yeah, just run our microphone. Hi, so this question is for Daniel. Um, are there efforts by car companies to collaborate among themselves for autonomous driving? So, for example, the Audis and BMW and Ford can talk among themselves on the road. The question again, was it, is it, is so it the, 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 the target? The, the, the cars target? can talk to uh, the cars from other companies. Yes. Uh, for the purpose of autonomous driving. Yes, I think this is this will be the future. Um, of course, right now everyone is developing the cars in a in a way in a two three layer system, in order to have maybe they have they will have maps, um, then they will have their um, lidars and everything. Um, we have a central fusion set of data where we do a kind of a own map, so we have a different different types of layers, so one, if one fails, then the others can jump in. So by that, you are able to drive autonomously throughout the city, but of course in the future, and uh, uh, also the other car manufacturers are working on, is that we have a common uh, respondence uh, and, and, and uh, interaction between the cars. Um, I think this will be another layer to make everything more clear, more safe, uh, in the future, that's what what uh, we are talking about, and uh, the companies are talking with each other at the moment, always within the the boundaries of uh, the the laws. And there's a, there's also a number of initiatives. For example, in the commercial space, the European car companies purchased here, which has mapping technology. So that's a significant investment they're making to share or at least standardize parts of those maps. The Linux Foundation um, will have an initiative on this, and uh, Lenaro, which is um, sort of a version of the Linux Foundation, but that produces software-based systems, um, called for an open source autonomous driving platform. So there's a clear industry need across the domain of the automotive industry, whether it's going from silicon all the way up to car manufacturing. There's an understanding that autonomous vehicles probably must be open or must have the degree of transparency so that they can actually interact, so that regulators can understand, so that you know people are safe. It's quite simple. But there's a lot of that exactly. happening behind exactly. the scenes. Exactly. And, and just to add that, because I was handling the here deal also on the Audi side, uh, funny enough, uh, the, 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 the uh, map thing works like that. that Maybe an Audi car will find out there's a hazard, something, either it's ice on the street, he will send that back to a server, and the server is then maybe used in another car, who then goes goes the same, di same direction and finds out. The car will warn him uh, then in beforehand and say, there's a, there's a hazard, there's ice on the street. And that's what's, that will be one of the layers. There will be more layers also to come. All right, thank you very much.